the orange paper, even 10 years on, is still uh, a unique case study in how advertising directly affects shareholder value rather than indirectly affecting it. These days, of course, shareholder value is still incredibly important. There's still some cynicism in the city as to how communications work. So it's a great case study today for people to get hold of. Well, when we look at the business objectives for the shareholder, Hutchinson One Power, they weren't a traditional shareholder. They were not a brand building company. They were traders. And they'd created a brand, or we'd created a brand for them, and they were looking to sell it. And they were quite open about that. And the first stage of selling it was to get it onto the stock market. Broadly, Orange had to do a few things. They had to grow earnings in the short term, but also provide evidence that those earnings would grow over the longer term, because the share price is a classic shorthand for the future potential of a business and a brand, rather than just its current value. So earnings and earnings growth and the, the extent to which the risk of the business was diversified were the key triggers. In the beginning, it wasn't called Orange. Uh, the, the trading name was Hutchinson Microtel. It had been the fourth mobile license that had been bought. Um, and we were working in partnership with Wolf Olins um, on a brand name and a brand identity. So Wolf Olins came up with the name Orange, and it seemed instinctively to be right. A bit crazy, a bit mad. We had to fly off to Hong Kong to present it to the, the Chinese billionaire who owned the business. And we did a big presentation about Orange. And he said to me, why not blue? Because uh, I don't think orange was a lucky colour in Hong Kong, but we explained to him orange. And that was the first step to do something that was entirely different from any mobile phone brand before. Well, let me just briefly sketch the world in which this award was given. In fact, it was the second award that, that Orange won in this period. It was a very different world. It was nearly 17 years ago that we started working on Orange. And can you believe it? Only one person in 10 had a mobile phone. That we, that we, rather than having them stuck to our ears as we now do, they were the big bricks, they were the phones used by brain yuppies in restaurants, and we all hated them. But we weren't the first one in. There was Vodafone, uh, there was Cellnet, another brand were just about to arrive called One to One. They'd all been given licenses to go into this new, new sector. But none of them had really gripped the public. None of them were really brands. And this was the orange opportunity to, how could you create a brand in this sector of a category which people hadn't yet learnt to love and to depend on. The market was effectively driven by confusion. It was an entire confusion oriented category. No one knew how to compare rates and tariffs and deals and techs and minutes and all those sorts of things. And Orange came in and changed the rules overnight. They effectively cleared it all up and said, right, what we're going to do is we're going to make mobile telecommunications two things. We're going to make it entirely and extraordinarily attractive and we're going to make it really simple. And it did all of that within this, this, this enormous vision of, of a future which is clean and clutter-free and wire-free and, and, and how it should be. So this, this pure vision of the future allied to this very simple delivery mechanism made Orange an unbelievably compelling brand at the time. I think that um, the, the creative approach developed by uh, Larry Barker and Rooney Carruthers um, and a brilliant film director um, and the overall team we were clear that we wanted to create orange as being much more than just a colour. Uh, we wanted it to be a value system that gave you confidence to go with this brand in the future. Don't worry, the future's bright, the future's orange. You won't change what you say, just how you say it. In the future, we'll think it's strange that voices ever travelled down wires. In the future, no one will be tied down. And in the future, the skies will be clearer, because the world of communications will be wire-free. Don't worry. The future's bright. The future's orange. When you saw that film, you were in the presence of something entirely different that chimed in with a deep inner need you have to be supported into this frightening world of the future. Orange would take you by the hand uh, and take you through it. It could have just been a gloss 
of the, the future will be nice. I know the, a bit of a mess today, but the future will be nice. Let's look at that. But actually said the future will be nice and we're going to clear up the mess today. That's a great promise to any kind of, by any kind of brand and, and Orange really encapsulated it superbly. Well, the first phase was to get the brand up. There were teaser posters, as you say, you saw the word listen and talk, but unbranded all over the place that what on earth is going on. Then you saw the commercial, the baby floating. But that was only a small part of it. We then actually delivered real messages. It wasn't just fluff. And per second billing, you used to have your calls rounded up the nearest minute. And Orange was the first company to bill you by the second. So there was a whole range of actual service points. And it's absolutely crucial this. It wasn't simply communication hot air. Here was a brand with a vision, but it also had a whole range of service benefits to the consumer. And you needed both the vision and the service points to create an effective brand. Orange believe in always giving our customers more. So from now on, we're giving all of our talk plan customers up to twice as many inclusive minutes each month. Or cutting their charges. It's one more reason why it could be game over for your home phone. Very interestingly, uh, we decided not to be, for example, comparative and competitive. We could have said, day one, save £20 a month with Orange instead of Vodafone or Cellnet. We could have done that, it would have failed. Until we'd entered the brand, we got an affection towards our brand, and then we could say, we are now £20 cheaper. So getting the sequencing of information was absolutely crucial. Get people emotionally engaged, and then give them competitive information about your product. This was the, this was the balance of the two inside consumers' brains that made it effective. But we shouldn't forget that what they've always done, and indeed what they did at launch, was they had an extraordinary amount of product innovation. And I think sometimes people underestimate the extent to which the campaign was premised on fact and advantage um, and the advocacy that comes with that, rather than just being a kind of hollow branding exercise. I think it's worth remembering the sort of brand that Orange was trying to be. Its leader was a man called Hans Snook, and he didn't really believe in market research. Um, except just to test things out. He believed in it, had an inner belief of the right way to do things. For example, at one stage, Orange's network quality was bad, and he knew that. Um, he said, so we did some research, and people said, well, people aren't bothered about network quality. They want to have a lower price and a cheaper handset. He said, no, I want to have the best network quality. He went to the city. He raised a billion pounds to invest in the network. The network became the best network. And after then, we did some more research. People said, yes, I like network quality. So it requires, it requires uh, a conviction, a conviction brand to the instincts to leap ahead of what market research might be saying and create the brand which then the consumers say they want. So this is what the judgment is. What do consumers really want? Because market research can't really tell you. Orange believe everything you want should be within your reach. To find out how Orange can bring you guides to music, comedy and film direct to your phone, even movie reviews, call 0800 80 10 80. Take your world with you. So. Orange contributed to shareholder value partly by the brand pull, partly by the service messages, but also by persuading uh, Nokia to put the Orange logo on his handset. So suddenly, the network you were on was a visible piece of status signaling. Very simple idea, but very powerful. You could flash around and show your friends what, what network you had. But more than this, because of this satisfaction, the churn that people leaving the network was dramatically reduced. Typically, other networks had three years of being with that network. We had nearly five years. This was the key, actually, to the whole shareholder value return. If you keep the customers for longer, it's much more valuable to the shareholder. Part of the reason for um, building the brand in the way they did was not just to make it a powerful consumer brand in the UK, but was to make it a powerful corporate brand for potential partners around the world. So the brand itself was quite quickly exported to um, other markets, which of course was massively earnings enhancing and profit enhancing, uh, and very quickly made it an acquisition target. We went uh, with Orange into India, we went to uh, Belgium, we went to Hong Kong, uh, we went to Australia, and Hodgson Wampoa had uh, franchises there, 
launch the orange brand in those markets. The future's bright. The future's orange. Well, in its day, Orange was a multimedia campaign. We didn't really use the web because it wasn't invented, but it was launched for a start on posters. Posters were used quite a lot, but the core of the brand energy did come from television because television allowed us to engage deeply with consumers and get our, our brand in their brain. So I don't think it could be done without television, but other media really came in along the way and made it feel a permanent part of your life and not just a brand who is advertising to you. I think if one thing's changed over the last 10 years is that the brand is doing more rather than just uh, saying stuff. So um, the cornerstones of the marketing plan are of course advertising but they're also things like Orange Wednesdays. With Orange Wednesdays you get a free ticket to the cinema. But be careful who you take. I mean, your girlfriend will never truly understand on Bikini 2. It's not going to happen. Uh, things like Rock Call, which is this fantastic um, voluntary uh, program in return for tickets for gigs. I am all the volunteers who painted, scraped and hammered and the amazing gigs we got in return. Orange Rock Call. And it's evolving into a brand that does stuff and gives you stuff rather than just says stuff about you. Two for one cinema tickets for all Orange customers. More from Orange for you. What you've seen is Orange move pretty easily into, um, well, business rather than just consumer use, broadband, all sorts of new, new revenue streams and new opportunities over your phone. And I, I think this is a brand that's moved very easily into that space because it was always premised as a, as a future facing brand. In the future, cable and satellite will make cinema obsolete. And in the future, man won't need woman, and woman won't need man. Not in our future. Orange don't think technology should change the world, just make it a better place. The future's bright. The future's orange. Great brands and great advertising always force a competitive response, and I think what Orange did was it forced the other networks to rethink what they were doing, and, and Cellnet genuinely did an orange to become O2, to have that very narrow look, feel, sense of possibility. You'll, uh, if you look carefully at the advertising, you'll see that um, the current end line is Together We Can Do More, which I think is actually quite a close cousin of um, the launch platform, if not the launch end line. So whenever we talk about orange, we're still talking about community, friendship, optimism, all those values that were actually written into the brand when it was first launched. Well, the legacy is still there because, ironically, the brand has now been through several owners and it's been through several agencies as brand custodians. And I think against the odds, it still resembles the brand that was launched 10, 12 years ago. When you track it, you'll still find people saying, oh, it's, it's the most optimistic of the brands, and it's the most cerebral of the brands, and it most speaks to community, which are all the things that um, were sort of baked into it very early on. Or, the thing that Orange did, and again, we all forget this, is look back at ads before Orange, and there were no Orange ads. Now, that's going to sound like a very weird thing to say, but Orange created a style of advertising, which um, was affectionately at WSRS known as do something swirly. But Swirly was good. It created a really, it kind of created a mood. It was some of the first bits of advertising that really created a sense of wanting to be in it, wanted to touch it, wanted to feel it, wanted to embrace it. And if you really thought about it too hard, it would all collapse. But that's not really the point. It created an enormous sort of uh, visual narrative with people rather than a kind of rational one. And following that, the number of people that would just say, well, just do something like Orange, because it, it touched people in a way that wasn't, wasn't clinical or wasn't easily understood, but really was emotional. And it was all beautiful, and it created a, a beautiful space you wanted to step into. And there's nothing wrong with advertising, not thinking too hard, but actually creating a sense of feeling and wonder that people wanted to engage with. I think the Orange campaign has been successful for a number of reasons. First of all, because 
It had fantastic cut through. It was like nothing else around. It had then, after that cut through, terrific continuity. For the first five years, certainly, you knew an orange ad a mile away. Um, and at the same time, it owned a piece in the consumer's brain which the consumer needed help with. It wasn't just about mobile phones, it was about anxiety about the future. And finally, it had this brand mantra, the future's bright, the future's orange, which you sort of began to believe in. And that's why it's in so many people's brains now, uh, because it's, it was a mantra to get them through. And even if they don't own a, an orange phone now, they probably have that slogan in their brains. The future's bright. The future's orange. What was really extraordinary, that this company was purchased just one year after this paper was written. In this paper, it talks about an extra £2.9 billion of shareholder value being created by this campaign. And we were very proud about that, but it was a huge underestimate because one year later, this company was not sold for £2.9 billion. It was sold for £29 billion. How much profit was the company making at that stage? scarcely a, a million pounds a year. So it was an incredible multiple, perhaps the biggest multiple ever in financial history. And it was created at its heart by a communication program and at its heart by a very brave client who was willing to go against the recommendation of old fashioned research. And well done them. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six.